Hello, everyone. Uh, well, welcome to the Startup Impact Summit and the pitching stage. Today, uh, we have a really cool topic about corporate and startup collaboration in Hong Kong, especially during COVID-19. So I'm Mehdi Swidi. I'm the head of FinTech and Startup Exchange for DBS. And I'm really excited to have uh, three startups, Hong Kong Bays, who work with us uh, most of the time, but especially during the COVID-19 to see with them what is the impact of the COVID-19 on startups, on their collaboration with a big corporate, but also what that means for them as an employer, and what is the different things that they have seen during, you know, that uh, complicated period situation, and give you some good uh, message and positive vibes also, because the COVID-19 is not only disruptive in a bad way, but also in a positive way. So maybe we can start with a round of introduction and start with you, Shini, right now and uh, say who you are, what you are doing, what is doing your company, and also because we are um, with people from across the world, maybe a few words about uh, uh, how startups is uh, doing well in Hong Kong. Sure, thanks, Melly. Hi, guys, my name is Cheney. I'm a co-founder of Apoidea. We are a AI company helping financial institutions to automate some of their operational process to make them more efficient by turning unstructured documents into structured data. So you can imagine unstructured documents are the word documents you have been um, working on all the day, all the time. And structured data is like the Excel file you, you may have also been working on. So we help, um, help um, financial institutions to turn word into Excel so that computers can make meaningful analysis on that. Um, so um, we're very honored to have been working with DBS uh, with Matt Lee um, over the past uh, a year. We have a team of like around 40-ish um, data scientists and engineers. They are all based in Hong Kong. So COVID is definitely a big challenge to us um, and I'm very happy to share more about our experience. Thank you, Alex. Yeah, hey, my name is Alex Montgomery. I'm the managing director of Company Cover. Uh, company Cover is focused on making uh, business insurance simple and easy for startups and SMEs, uh, first here in Hong Kong, but then moving out to the rest of Asia Pacific. Uh, what we found during COVID is that risk management suddenly becomes a front and center topic for most companies. Uh, and it's our role to help identify which risks can be sold to insurers so that you can identify uh, how to focus on just your company moving forward. Uh, the good news is that although uh, this does seem like a trying time for companies. If we look at some of the biggest companies right now, most of them were started uh, during the last financial crisis. So it's actually a good opportunity to be a startup right now in Hong Kong and around Asia. Thank you very much. And maybe we can go with you now, Ambrose. Hi, my name is Ambrose. I'm the CTO of uh, CoverGo. Um, so if I introduce a bit of uh, the company CoverGo, uh, what we do is that we are uh, B2B insure tech and we sell uh, different solutions. Uh, to make sure that um, a lot of different co insurance companies, uh, so brokers, agents, insurers, bank insurance, and also other third parties, can digitize and automate all the different processes. And um, yeah, basically that, that, that's it. So yeah, the topic of COVID-19 talks a lot. Uh, I mean, it's pretty, it's in the same area as what we do. Wonderful, thanks a lot. Uh, so as you can see, we have AI company and InstaPec company. This is very interesting because that's the company that has the most of the leads of uh, the, during the COVID-19. So maybe uh, before we can go more on the details of the COVID-19 and the collaboration with big corporate, you can give um, a, bit, a, a bit of sense of what is concreted with your company, some facts, uh, maybe uh, explain one of your main products that you have uh, to share with, uh, with attendee here. Maybe we can come back with you uh, directly to, uh, on price to start it. Uh, sure, um, I mean, if we talk about one of the main products we do, um, um, so what we offer is like a, a lot of different APIs. So a lot of digital companies or startups are using uh, just the APIs to be able to produce uh, some front-end applications like client portals or administ administration portals, distribution portals, any kind of portals to be able to sell insurance, uh, I mean insurance policies or be able to renew policies or endorsements and stuff like this. Um, so yeah, basically this is, uh, if we're talking about the topic of COVID-19, face-to-face um, -face is not necessarily something that is um, getting stronger and stronger. Everybody goes just on the internet. So you want all your different processes to be on the internet, and that's what we do. Um, yeah, that's our main product, yeah. Alex, do you want to continue on uh, this topic? Yeah, sure. 
Uh, and so uh, right now, so I guess before all of COVID started, we started to look into the, uh, the, the startup uh, environment in Hong Kong and tried to find out uh, what were the people's issues with insurance. And what we found was actually very surprising. So uh, we, we did a research across uh, over 100 startups within Hong Kong, and we found that uh, over 90% of them uh, were underinsured. 65% didn't even know what insurance they had purchased. They didn't know what they were covered for. And 10% of uh, the startups that we identified didn't even have the legally mandated employees' compensation or MPF insurance, right? And I think this speaks to generally how startups run, right? We're focused on a very specific business problem, a very specific uh, audience. And as we build our companies, uh, we, we continue to sort of push off the insurance questions until later on. Uh, but on the other hand, we see companies and, and why they struggle. Uh, I mean, as startup founders and uh, work, people working in a startup, we all know that most startups fail, right? Uh, nine in 10 uh, in, uh, IT startups fail in the US. Mm -hmm. uh, now that's, you know, that may be a scary number to hear, but I'm not here to tell you that nine in 10 of you are gonna fail. Uh, in fact, by looking at the risks that we face and sort of categorizing them and managing them, uh, we can actually put ourselves ahead of the competition. Uh, and so a key product for us uh, would be our cyber liability insurance. Uh, right now during COVID, more people are working from home. Uh, that means you have a different set of risks. Uh, maybe your employees might have a laptop open at a coffee shop. Uh, what happens if they forget to lock it and walk away while they go to the bathroom? Uh, how do you manage the risk that uh, potentially your client data, your intellectual property could be uh, viewed by other people? And uh, so we have a, a great cyber reliability insurance products that we uh, partner with insurers uh, and then some others as well. But go ahead, Tini. Thank you. Um, uh, our company's uh, major product right now is a product um, that we work with commercial bank to help them automate the process of lending approval. So a key uh, area in corporate lending approval is to evaluate the financial statement of a company. And it usually takes around three hours for a financial analyst to re read through the whole financial statement from, from the income statement, balance sheets, um, and down to each uh, disclosure notes. That is a um, very heavy workload process, um, which requires like, a highly trained uh, technical um, financial analyst that really understand each item in the statement. Um, it's a long process, and even though it's just a three hour process, but then because like, if you have to work between the teams, then it would become a weak process to, to turn around. Um, what we do is uh, we have the AI solution to help um, the bank to shorten the preparation of this from three hours to five minutes. The AI will extract the financial statements, doing all the analysis needed, so that like the, um, the banking staff would only need to review the results, um, uh, correcting some of the uh, minor mistakes made by AI, then it's good to go. So um, it's, um, um, it's saving the department's time by at least 80%. And it proves that like um, in, in the banking sector, in the financial industry, there's been a lot of manual process which still require lots of the manual workflow. And we believe like with such automation and, and optimization, we can actually release people from doing all those repetitive jobs and really contributing to areas they can really uh, fully utilize their brain power. Thank you very much, guys. Alex, you mentioned about a couple of facts on, uh, on our Kong startup uh, ecosystem and SME ecosystem. So, how do you tackle those problems and how do you reach out to those companies to, to promote what you are doing? Because I think you have a really specific value proposition for them, a kind of unique here, and how you can just uh, you know, uh, promote your services, but also develop your services with them. Yeah, so uh, I find that we're very lucky to be in a place like Hong Kong. Uh, and I'm, I'm, I'm sure this is true in a lot of other areas across uh, Asia Pacific. Uh, but being in a part of communities, communities like uh, W Hub or other types of communities, uh, startup communities, allows us as founders and as uh, startups to uh, share with each other. And so that's actually been the, uh, the most uh, efficient way to get the message across. Uh, we have four core tenants within our company. We need to make insurance uh, easy to understand, so allow people to learn about the insurances that they need, easy to purchase, so they trust what they're buying, easy to manage, and then easy to make claims. Uh, and uh, that education part is really, I think, what you're coming down to, is how do, we, how do we get in front of enough people so that they understand that in a high-risk, survival-of-the-fittest type of economy, uh, that we can all do our best to be as fit as we can. 
right? And so I think that's where we really work with our with the startup community, with uh, business communities that focus on different verticals, uh, and uh, through those things, we'll do webinars or make sure that we have opportunities just to participate. Obviously, there's less uh, you know hand-to-hand -hand handshaking right now, uh, but there's definitely. So, did you see a gap on educational uh, side for these companies to know how to have access to these uh, solutions here? Because you spoke about webinars, how to communicate with them. So it's one of the problems you need to take care of as well to promote uh, the goodwill of, uh, of your company. Yeah, absolutely. I think when, when we talk with uh, startup founders, especially early stage startups, uh, they haven't spent very much time in assessing risks. So we take them through a risk management framework where we uh, identify how risks fit in sort of a quadrant of uh, severity and frequency. And then if you start putting the different risks that might face your company along that quadrant, you can start to see, oh, these are the risks I can manage by setting in, uh, in place good processes. These are the risks that, I, uh, that are actually you know, company killers, and I need to put real resources and focus on handling those. And then there's another set of uh, maybe less frequent but very high consequence risks that you can say, well, these are really not risks I can plan for, but there are insurance products on the market that can uh, handle the, at least the financial liability with the risk. Okay, wonderful. Thank you very much. Ambrose, I have a couple of questions for you as well. So you spoke about API. What does it really mean API for people who don't understand the technology side of it and how you apply this API to the Intotech ecosystem that you have, insurance clients? And after this, I will ask you another question about uh, collaboration uh, with DBS and Startup Exchange, but can you first reply to this one? Uh, sure, yeah, API is just, uh it's like a, a bit of a bit like an open door. It's an endpoint. So that means that anybody can basically connect to to you uh, and get some of the data that you that you own or that belongs to another third party in the ecosystem. If you are building an ecosystem, so we're not technically only doing an ecosystem. We also do I mean uh, build APIs for specific uh, clients that we have. Uh, so insurance companies or brokers or agents or also bank insurance. Uh, also, there's other companies that try to that want to have a, an ecosystem, so we deliver APIs for them, and we try to be also uh, to foster uh, the ecosystem with our APIs. They are basically the same. Some of them are more like private, some of them are more open, but yeah, basically uh, it helps the whole community be able to share information, share data, like just be pushing and pulling data. Um, now, of course, there's like a strong set of authentication authorization based on different uh, set of data uh, you want to use. Uh, and there's also a lot of security. Uh, this would talk also to the cybersecurity product uh, uh, Alex has. But yeah, basically that's the, that's the gist of it. Yeah, so actually Company Cover uses some of CoverGo's APIs. And so for us in deciding what type of APIs we would use, it really came down to where does a, a, an IT provider fit into our business structure. Uh, and uh, you know, previously I was mentioning about sort of the different risks that you can manage and others that you can't. Well, uh, the, the security of the systems you use is actually one that you can really manage well. Uh, so when we did our due diligence looking at various providers, we found that CoverGo's APIs uh, used uh, the absolute best uh, possible practices. Uh, and that allowed us really to have, uh, not only give ourselves confidence, but we could then uh, go to the insurers that we work with and say, look, we're uh, working on this entire ecosystem product uh, and you can trust in the, the way that we communicate back and forth with you, that it's a secure, uh, protocol, secure uh, way to communicate uh, between the individual startups that maybe you know, are on the ground for a few years uh, and the insurers who have been around for uh, you know, centuries in some cases. Kine, do you want something on API and uh, how you can apply this API to uh, machine learning and NLP? Yeah, um, so I think API has been very helpful in many ways. Of course, like when we work with banks, most of the cases, some like DBS is great uh, because like DBS has been like having a cloud first strategy, so a lot of things can happen on API. But then for some other banks which are still using like data centers, they require more on-premise solution, which uh, like external API may not be that available. But then um, we're also seeing a trend of banks um, pushing more things on the cloud, um, maybe partially, and then finally, I guess I'm ninety-nine percent of the banks will be like DBS to be all cloud. And then by then, um, I, I definitely agree API will be a very um, meaningful way of communicating, especially a lot of the cases nowadays like in the asset management industry, in, in investment, um, a lot of the communication actually machine to machine. And for that, you have to, you, you need to have an API. And then there will be more like third party solutions, uh, 
um, on aggregating servers and, and, and different things that also require API communication. So I, I, I think it's unavoidable. Thank you very much. Uh, Ambrose, I would like to come back to you because you are the CTO here on, 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 the, on this panel discussion. So um, I saw one of your products where it's really easy to select a tool that you want by API and drag it directly on a, on a no-code platform that you can help to, to set up it. So do you see that use was, so first of all, it's, it's a good use. Uh, I, I see it and I really like it. But do you think that using this kind of solutions has been more um, adopted during COVID-19 or is it a solution that maybe companies like big insurance we're working with are more interesting because the COVID-19 was here and they had to develop the solution to stay business as usual uh, faster than before and they had to change their digital agenda. So I'm not sure that the no-code platform uh, we have been building is um, more popular because of COVID-19. Uh, like the set of all our products as a whole are more popular, including this one. So it's not because it's no code, it's because it's completely digital and you make everything digital and automatic and completely online. Uh, no code is not necessarily helping with this. Uh, no code empowers our own um, uh, clients, so uh, the companies building those kind of uh, platforms, like a, let's say a client portal. Mm -hmm. uh, so it empowers them to be able to build them themselves. So they don't need to call, like for example, and the defender to be able faster? to rebuild things. Is it faster to do it like this? Um, is it faster? Not basically, it's quite, it's quite the same. Like the, the main goal is to empower them to be able to build this themselves so that they don't need to call the IT vendor, for example, every time they want to build something new. They do it themselves. So the no-code tools make them be able to... So of course, no-code is never going to replace code. Uh, it's just that when you, risk, when you restrict the space, so if you are industry-specific or quite pro product-specific, you can start to have some kind of no-code tool that helps you um, being able to, to 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 build what the products that you want to that you want to do, of course it's restricted. But uh, now, if we're talking about the insurance industry, people are be being able to create the, all the portals for all the different actors to be able to sell insurance and to be able to do a claim, to be able to do these things, and they can do these platforms by themselves without calling an IT vendor. So that's pretty pretty good. It's more about empowering uh, the, our clients into building what they want. Now, of course, we offer full support. So sometimes it can be easy, sometimes it can be complicated for a complicated product. Uh, and if it's complicated, we, we just do it ourselves and we, we, use a, and we show them how to, to use the, the no-code tool. Okay, thank you. Uh, I would like just to stay with you a bit and, and ask you a bit of, uh, what is your experience with big corporate? We work together, you are one of the first company on board on my startup exchange last year. We had that uh, project that we deliver and you went live with a, with a corporate banking. So can you give us more explanation of what you have done for them? And what is the impact of uh, such a uh, product delivered by your company to a big corporate like DBS? Sure, uh, so the product was, uh, I mean, the partner, the partnership with was DBS, bank in the bank interest side. Um, and uh, what it was doing basically is doing the whole uh, financial needs analysis cycle and proposals uh, based on the robo advisor, based on the needs that were uh, being uh, calculated during the answering questions on, a, on an FMA uh, application on the iPad. And we just delivered this for, um, for them. Um, I think they were pretty happy about this. Uh, They've been using quite a lot and it make them be able to um, not feel um, basically a lot of papers and PDFs of applications and stuff like this. Everything is basically completely automated by just a digital platform. So that's quite useful. Uh, concerning the experience, like what we learned and what probably they learned from us. Uh, so they learned from us how fast, um, how fast building a product can be. It can literally be 10 times faster when you're in a small focused team and very exper uh, experienced in this kind of things. Uh, also the way of working, uh, you know, with the agile methodology and uh, working with sprints and be able to, to um, not going through a waterfall cycle. Like you need to do all the requirements in the beginning and for a, for a whole year trying to build what you did in the requirements. It's more about like every week you adjust uh, the, the requirements based on the user uh, experience and improving the platform little by little. So this is the kind of things that we, I mean, I think we, 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 we taught uh, all some of the people that were working with us in DBS. Now in exchange, uh, we got a lot of industry expertise uh, from, the, the, from DBS. Uh, it can be in the financial side, on the wealth, wealth side, uh, as well as the insurance side. Uh, also, um, I mean, the bank insurance is, is acting as an agent. 
So we were working as well with some of the partners of DBS, which also increased the exposure that uh, our company had, which is quite great. So the experience was uh, really, really good. Okay, thank you very much. Alex, I will come back to you just after, but a quick question for you, Shine. Uh, is there still uh, something or there is an issue here? Apologize. Or maybe it's the Zoom limitation thing when you don't have an account, <laughs> 45 minutes. <laughs> is that it? <laughs> Are we back, folks? Are we online? Is it good? Okay, we had a, a small issue with uh, with Zoom. Uh, thanks very much, Ambrose. So we we'll come back to you, Alex, just after. Um, Shine, I would like to ask you also kind of the same question. So basically, we start we start the project with you uh, in Napodia during the COVID nineteen. So it was I think in March or April. Yes. Uh, since that day, and we are still working yep. together uh, with you and the team of fixed income. Could you share with us uh, what is the project, what is the purpose of it, what is the impact that it can generate for, for the business unit, and, and what was the relationship that you have with the team, feedbacks, uh, improvement, uh, and you know, the name of, uh, of my accelerator is Startup Exchange, so the exchange between your team and, and my team. Sure, sure, sure. So um, our, our project with DBS is exactly the product I've just mentioned, um, the, um, the product that helps um, like um, optimize the lending approval process for for corporate lending. Um, so so um, yes, we have been working during the COVID nineteen. So again, I have to say like we're really lucky to be in Hong Kong, which we at least we don't have like total lockdown. Um, we still can have meeting with mask on, but at least we can have like pretty normal business activity. But then I guess like um, this COVID nineteen is also pushing us. Um, to really to be a digital um, like like business development era, um, as uh, in the past we all know that like for financial institution we respect face to face face to face meeting. It it, it means like uh, I I know this person well when when I do a handshake I know whether this guy is confident or not. Like by the body sketcher by by the face to face meeting no more than just doing a call or doing like video conference. And of course, like in the past, if you have to do video conference, you must go to the video conference room instead of like in front of your desktop. So, um, and then people will be fighting for that video conference room um, because like that room is, um, is very expensive with all the expensive equipments and um, there could only be one room per floor. So, um, so this um, COVID has made all the financial institution more open-minded for video conferencing, for, for virtual um, interaction. A very good example is that we have actually just closed a deal in, in Germany without really being there. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I almost think it was impossible before COVID-19 because after all, like, um, if you have to do BD, especially B2B business, especially if, um, your account, if your counterparty is a bank, you, you really have to fly there and meet them at least once for the final product meeting uh, before they can really give you the, the green light. But then like given the COVID-19, we all know that it's a travel ban, so it's impossible to fly there, but they're really urgently in need of a product. So they're happy to do everything um, via uh, 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 video conferencing. And then um, it's not just a single case, we're also closing deal in Malaysia and in, in even Middle East like Dubai, um, in, in Taiwan, all virtually. And then we can see that um, people are more open-minded and, and uh, more open up to, um, to, to uh, they're more active on LinkedIn first, and they're more open-minded and uh, they're more open to like cold mails uh, in LinkedIn. And it, it also enabled us to do um, business like, like, like cold calling and, and, and like business development outreach much easier these days. So I guess I, it, it's definitely posing a lot of challenges on business development, but then it's also um, opening up a lot more doors for us. Thank you very much. Alex, the nature of your business is a bit different. Uh, Shine and Ambrose can work with really large company. You are targeting more smaller company and startups, right? So how was the interaction with these companies during COVID-19, even if you cannot meet them directly? You spoke about webinar before, you spoke about uh, all the educational uh, things that you have done, but when you need to close a deal or when you need to, to elaborate a proposition for a company, how it works for you? Yeah, I mean, I think what uh, Chini said is very similar for us as well. Uh, that what were traditionally barriers to entry suddenly have been taken away because we've been forced into a different, uh, a different environment, a different mindset. Uh, I think, actually, I want to sort of build on what Ambrose said as well with this too. Uh, he talked about how no code 
enable sort of a DIY mentality. Um, and it's sort of similar with sort of access to resources at a smaller level. You talked about how even at a, even at a large company, uh, people are trying to figure out how to use smaller teams and more agile methodologies. And I think that's sort of the, the overarching narrative over the last 20 years is how we've moved away from uh, needing a specialist to handle each part of everything into where we, uh, you know, suddenly, um, I mean, I don't know about you, but my eggplant parmesan has gotten much better after COVID. I've been forced to be in the kitchen. I'm forced to working with the ingredients. And I think uh, for small businesses, it's actually the same kind of situation, right? We suddenly have these tools that were there beforehand, but they weren't forced into our everyday life. Uh, and now because of that, we're able to uh, interact at a much faster rate uh, than we were when we were tied down to the expensive conference room or the face-to-face -face meetings. So uh, for us, it's really been about uh, these long trends that have just sort of crystallized at a, at a moment and allowed us to really uh, reach out to companies and, and work at a much faster pace. Thank you very much. Uh, you spoke about agile methodology, work uh, teams. Um, one of the things I want to say also is like startups, it's sometimes a synonym of uh, tech adoptions. What is the most tech uh, companies in the world are often the startups. So one of the things I would like to ask uh, the three of you right now is uh, how agile are you and how COVID-19 you were ready before? So did you create the framework, workflow, and the setups to work from home before the COVID-19 impact uh, your company and businesses, or you had to be really proactive and do a sprint in two days or one day to uh, to to allow this kind of uh, of work from home. Maybe you can start with the CTO first. Sure. So the thing is that we didn't really change any of our practices. Uh, they were already set up before, and um, also uh, everything that we were that we used to do before. I mean, everything was also quite dematerialized. So uh, every sprint meeting that we were doing, like if we were talking about the agile methodology, was already online. Uh, we have different offices in Southeast Asia anyway, so some of the teammates are not there. Uh, so we need to make them be able to connect and be able to, to talk to us. Uh, we don't do conference rooms. We think it's, it doesn't make any sense to us. We never, I mean, even when we have 10 people in the office, the 10 people, they are in front of their computer with, uh, with a headset and they talk to their own computer. Uh, we don't, uh, yeah. So in, in terms of practices, we didn't really change. Now we can see that all our clients changed, and in, uh, in our opinion, in a much more healthy way and much more practical for us because it's quite it's quite hard for start, especially for startups, uh, to go door to door and go from a meeting to another meeting um, in different places. Uh, Hong Kong is quite dense, so it's quite good in here. But uh, I mean, especially in other countries, it's quite hard. Uh, if you are able to have a meeting from 10 to 11 and 11 to 12 uh, back to back, it's a huge amount of time saved. And for, uh, I mean, for us, for especially on the sales area, it's uh, it's huge. Um, so we didn't change, but because our customer changed, uh, for us, it's just much better. Alex, do you want to continue on this point? Yeah, sure. I mean, our, I guess our story, uh, although there may be some similarities, in, in other ways is very different. Uh, purchasing insurance is a very traditional field. And so uh, we were very much in person, face to face. And it was sort of a shock uh, when COVID hit. Uh, at first, of course, we were just concerned about the community. Uh, we actually released a uh, sort of as soon as COVID hit a, a COVID a free COVID insurance for the startup community. Um, and so luckily in Hong Kong right now, it's not as bad. Uh, but there was a time when people were really worried about that risk. So we decided to offer a insurance product just for free to the startup community here so that if, uh, you know, knock on wood, anybody did get uh, uh, get COVID in your company, then you'd uh, be covered at least some of the hospital uh, fees. Uh, but as we sort of got a little bit further into it and passed the shock, we had to make some really significant changes to our business processes, uh, both because the types of products that uh, companies were buying was very different uh, and because uh, we just weren't really used to it. Uh, but I think uh, it probably, you know, it wasn't like a two sprint or, or a one sprint decide to change, but we made a pretty gradual transition to it. And I think it was a relatively painless process. It was, um, it, it was, we were had to be a lot more conscious of the way we worked and the choices that we made. Uh, but I think that it probably ended up making us more efficient in the long run. Thank you very much. Michine, how was the impact on your company? Were you ready to work from home before or did you have to change a few things? Sure. 
So uh, I, I personally came from investment banking background, which um, is famous for having a FaceTime culture that you have to be in the office all the time, even though you, you get nothing to do, you cannot live before your boss lives, um, you have to stay till very late. Um, I guess like, it, it has always been um, a part of the manager insecurity of whether like, the subordinates are doing their job well. Um, is a um, unclear definition of the task, the KPI, the output that leads to this result. So um, when, when I started my own company, I've always been very conscious about this. Um, and hopefully that by building a very clear KPI or like OKR, um, like the, the, the targets for each employee, we can build a trust there that I, I don't care where you are, whether you're at home or in the office, as long as you deliver the, the key results, then it's all right. So that's why um, we, we also apply Agile, and we are even pushing Agile methodology to, um, to the HR and like to, to the compensation end as well. Because like in Agile methodology, there is a term called story point to measure um, like the, the value of a task. And then like each, um, like for, for each spring, which is like two weeks, like um, the team would discuss the tasks they have to do, um, the, 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 the number of story points they're taking. Um, we are linking the compensation to story points. So um, everyone has a baseline salary mm -hmm. um, and the baseline expectation of the story point. And every story point they, they, they do as an extra, we pay per each story point as a commission. So um, it gives us a total trust on our employees um, that they, they can do as many story points as they want and they'll be, they be compensated as fair as they, they have contributed. Um, by that way, I just have to count the number of story points and see whether they're doing the job. I don't care whether they're at home, whether they are coming in the office late or whether they are working very hard and, and get a pool all nighter for the work. Uh, by doing that, uh, we're actually now even uh, like, like throughout the whole, like, like the most serious moments in COVID, during the COVID-19, we have been um, uh, having all work from home for, for almost two months, it's fine. And then right even till now, I guess like most companies have, get, uh, ha have got all their stuff back to the office, but we're still having like three day work from home and just having like Tuesday and Thursday as like the meeting day for, and the social day for the employees. And because uh, we, we have realized that for most of our staff, they, they think like it will be quite productive for them to, to concentrate on their work three times a week, and then they, they spend two days a week on interacting. Okay. Um, of course, I, um, we, we realize a challenge for this is like the social needs of employees are, are pretty much like sacrificed. So uh, we, 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 we take out from our CCTV footage that um, our, our staff came back to the office at night to play poker themselves. This is really interesting. So you anticipate my question about uh, the employee adoption. I think it's uh, quite good on, on your company. Maybe uh, Alex and, and Ambrose, you can uh, complement on the employee adoption of working from home and and COVID situation. So I, I can share. Um, I mean, just just one thing for the I mean about the last question. Just to uh, just to make it clear, uh, I'm totally in support of what you said, Jimmy. Uh, if you are a manager slash, slash leader and you're checking the attendance instead of the work being done, you're not doing your job. Um, so, I mean, it's time to change all these different practices. Uh, in our company, the, the, um, I mean, the, the, the policies is you come to office if you want, you work from home if you want. We have a certain set of uh, very short meetings every day, like 10 minutes. Uh, that normally people have to go to. Uh, well, it's online, so they don't need to move. Huh? You can, they can do this from their computer. And there's, like, for example, one every Monday. Right? It's about two hours. I mean, that's it. Everything else, it's up to you. you just you deliver value. That's it. This is all. This is all we do. If you do anything else than than, than this and checking the attendance, it's it's an issue. So I still come from an investment banking background and. Um, they were getting better uh, every year. Um, maybe now they are also on par with uh, all the different uh, the, the startup community is doing. Uh, now to come back from the to, to the uh, employee adoption. Well, it's basically what uh, what I told you. Most of them are very happy. Some of them had to travel an hour every day, which is an hour lost, uh, or it can be sometimes two hours uh, as well. Like one, yeah, yeah, one one hour to go to the office, one hour to go back to uh, to Kowloon somewhere. Uh, so for them, they just stay in, just stay at home. Um, some of them, they yeah, as uh, Chini said, they need some. Uh, of course, uh, well, there are more tech people, so social is not just kidding. <laughs> um, so we do a set of uh, games uh, almost every Fridays now uh, for the company, so that everybody is able to have some kind of social activities and be able to uh, physically bond a bit here and there. 
Of course, after we go out, uh, we have to. It's Hong Kong. It's a great place to party. Um, so yeah, yeah, uh, the, the adoption I is great. Uh, but it has already been adopted before COVID. So yeah. Yeah, I definitely do not miss the hour in the uh, MTR crowded in sardines with everyone else. That's for sure. Um, we actually did a survey of our staff before, uh, before making the decision to do remote or uh, at work. Uh, and we found that about 80% of them uh, preferred to do remote even before they tried it. Uh, so there was a, a really good incentive for our employees to sort of show that they could do it well. And, uh, and, and the results have been actually phenomenal. I think if we did the survey again, it would probably be 100% that prefer it now. Uh, and the only tricky thing, I think, and both of you have mentioned this a little bit, is figuring out how to balance the sort of social side of work. There's so much, uh, so much uh, momentum that we build by being a part of a team. And uh, the only way to get around that, I think, has been to be very deliberate about setting up times to do things together. And sometimes it's even better because you don't have the pressure of work that you're supposed to be doing and uh, the conversation you're having at the water cooler. You instead get to say, okay, this is a time we're putting together, putting aside just for uh, companies to enjoy being a part of a team. Wonderful. Um, we, we spoke about many things right now. We spoke about how being a manager, being uh, an entrepreneur, being, being also an employee for a company. So I, will ask, uh, I would like to ask a last question about it. It's about how you shape the culture and, and uh, the up skills of your employee when they are working from home. And also another question will be like, we saw many issues with mental health because people were staying at home. So you, you mentioned about socialization just before. So how do you shape this? How do you shape the culture of your company? How do you uh, shape the, the skills of your employees and how you take care of uh, your, their mental health except socialization? Uh, sure. I mean, about the culture, um, I'm not exactly sure that uh, being remote or in office does change uh, changes anything. We have a set of company values. To be honest, they are very close to the net Netflix ones. But yeah, we have a set of uh, company values. This kind of, a, and it's it's public inside, for example, our trailer board. Everybody can go back to it if they forget about these. And um, so, I mean, everybody just focus on. The, these are values, and uh, we, yeah, uh, in the end, it doesn't really matter if you are uh, in, in office or, or uh, yeah. About training, um, again, it doesn't really change anything. Um, I mean, being being able to be, uh, we are always online, uh, and sometimes we just want to have a discussion because it's a bit faster than typing, and it takes two seconds to be on Google Meet anyway, so you, you just start a room, done. It takes really, uh, yeah, two seconds. So it doesn't really change for us, like being face to face or being uh, or working remotely to be able to train our employees as well. Uh, also, most of them like we we, we train we, we teach them to teach themselves anyway. Uh, so they we focus in a lot of uh, a lot on self training, and they they don't necessarily need us to be able to to uh, I mean to um, to empower themselves. Um, yeah, that's about it. Alex Chine. Yeah. So. I guess our experience is a little different here. The uh, before COVID, when somebody started working on something and they had a, you know, they were a little unsure about something or didn't have the confidence around an issue, they'd turn around to the person at the desk next to them and they would ask a question. And although it is really easy just to start up a Zoom call or a Google Meet or something like that, there's still I think a little bit of a, a barrier to making that communication as fast as possible. And I think uh, it's been something that we've sort of gradually improved on. Uh, in fact, it's sort of more of just an asynchronous workflow where you don't, you expect that you, if you need to know something, you need to find it out. And it's your responsibility as an employee to make that connection with someone else and, and do it. But it doesn't happen quite as organically as it did before. Uh, and so that has been actually, I think, I think we're moving in the right direction, but it's actually a challenge uh, that we want to make sure that we've got uh, the you know, best educated workforce in our industry. Uh, and we've got to make sure that we create those opportunities and make sure that employees understand what's their responsibility in that learning process. Yeah, very fast, just to come back to the uh, async uh, type of work that uh, I'm mentioning. Yeah, it's something that more and more people adopt. I don't know if you know this company for, for example, Basecamp. Uh, that is promoting, that means everything needs to be written. You don't necessarily need to communicate with people in real time uh, because you destroy uh, time of focus uh, and that can damage also your company. Also, that makes you being able to be much more global and work on different time zones. So this is something that more and more people adopt and we adopt it as well. Yeah, yeah totally agree. After all, like being in the office means like it will be um, 
make people being lazy and they would just yell out, hey, I need some help, and then they, they expect immediate response. But then that deficiency uh, disrupts a lot of the people, like the routine and focus. And being at home means that you can't really be like disturbing others that easily. You have, if you're slacking a person, um, you are testing a person on Slack, then you you may expect um, you only get the response like 15 minutes later, um, and that means that it's actually a very good training for our staff to be organized. They have to organize their schedule. Um, like our, our young colleagues um, didn't have the, the 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 habit of checking their calendar. They now have to check their calendar uh, for meetings that that have been booked. Um, they have to improve their communication skill. How to be how, how to um, get more efficient communication itself, like typing a long article, how they can get it short and clear, um, how they can, and how they can do better expectation management. After all, like, uh, expectation management is very crucial in the workplace, but then, like, it's something you have to learn um, uh, proactively. And by, because uh, you don't get immediate response and you cannot really have, have a, um, like, hourly check on, like, people's progress, uh, people start, have to make like expectation management of hey I'm doing a task I'll give you by like um, uh, end of day tomorrow then setting expectation right would keep the ball rolling smoothly. Well, this is very interesting. I think I think we share a lot of uh, knowledge and content here. Maybe uh, I have still a couple of questions, but maybe if we have question from 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 the attendee, uh, you can open uh, the chat and, and see if it's possible to to ask our our speaker to some of your thoughts. Uh, but uh, we come back to you before we have uh, any question here. We have a new normal now. Do you think it will be the norm of everything, or will we come back to something more hybrid with what we had as a routine before, to face-to-face -face the meetings, especially for the collaboration with the big corporates, or we will stay and continue to work with uh, what we have unlocked and protected? Uh, I think it's uh, the, the new normal is there. It's going to stay. So obviously there's a curve. So it goes a bit like this, right? And you start to be much more and, go in, and it's going to go back to uh, so at some point a bit in the middle, which is an improvement. And this is going to stay for sure. Uh, people, for some reason, didn't really uh, uh, connect in the beginning with the idea of people being able to work completely remotely. Um, and this is not, I mean, I mean, there's no studies that actually go towards that point. Uh, nobody, no studies actually prove that there are more people work, working better in the office. People realize this after a few months uh, of uh, remoting. They understand that the productivity uh, is the same or has increased, uh, especially because people are less tired, less stressed. There's less. Uh, I mean, there, there's no MTR anymore. <laughs> there's no nobody is going is commuting, so it's just much better in some ways. And also, you have a bit. You tend to take the pauses that you actually really need as well uh, during the day. And um, sometimes something they can pollute. Uh, people uh, working uh, at home feel guilty for working at home, so they work even more. So this is uh, <laughs> it's a good point or a bad point if you're a manager. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> Just take it or leave it. But yes, so there's all these little uh, things that um, I mean, it's not going to go back. Uh, it's there to stay. Yeah, we're talking about this from a company's perspective. Uh, if we pull our view back a little bit and look at the consumer space as well, though, I mean, it wasn't that long ago that we'd walk into a bank to do our banking. Uh, and I don't think any one of us right now would say, oh, I'd rather walk into a bank than to pull out my application on my phone and get it done. So I think, well, there will be some, uh, some you know, when COVID's gone and we feel safe, there will be a lot of relief that we can meet in person. I think the, the fact is that this is a broader trend, a longer trend, and uh, COVID has only accelerated our movement towards that as uh, startups, as SMEs, and even as large companies. I believe it would definitely be, be a mix of both. Um, um, we'll be back to some more face-to-face -face interaction, that's for sure, like that's human need. But then we also realize some of the um, uh, communication not necessarily uh, just can be done by by face to face. So business travel will definitely come back, but then definitely at a much smaller scale, uh, because like companies realize they can get business done without business travel. Um, they will start to see um, instead of like flying four times to meet a client before closing the deal, you can just meet the client once to really like shake the hand and build a bonding, build a trust, and then leaving all the remaining of the communication done online um, on. Um, from like the, the, the work from home uh, 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 practice perspective, um, 
definitely work from home to stay. We actually have been seeing like in, 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 in US or in other Western countries, um, um, companies have a more flexible culture would allow like say like um, like like um, like, like uh, uh, parents who have to take care of their kids can work from home like two three days a week. Um, Asian countries haven't been that flexible in the past, but I'm sure like in in the upcoming future, uh, corporates will be more open minded to this kind of like practice. Uh, and then and then like we have seen like tech companies like Nike has already removed their their office then it seems like co-working space is, is definitely coming up again, even though like, like we were also like, like we were kind of like failed a bit, but then uh, co-working space actually has just started, it's like the, the best timing. And even so there could be more like corporate like training that would be required because after all, if we're really working more uh, at home and then we have less social interaction during work, um, it means like the HR has to spend more efforts on bonding the, the staff that there's definitely more like engagement in like corporate training, corporate bonding, team building activities. Thank you very much. Uh, I think I had an issue with my mic from the question that we see, but uh, it's been taken care. Okay, thanks guys. Um, the most surprising um, effect or impact of the COVID-19 on you or your company, what is this? Uh, the fact that it didn't have much impact. Okay. Um, I mean, that's true that's, uh, for, for our business. The, our business is made for people wanted, wanting to, to sell online. So this is basically the crux of the, the issue and being able to, um, to, auto, to automate everything they do. Uh, no paperwork, nothing, everything online. So, I mean, we got quite a bit, quite a lot of business actually from COVID. Some of our business actually went down and some of the other business came up. So basically it's kind of balanced. Um, some people like we stopped some projects because they were they ran, just ran out of money because of COVID. Uh, so just some 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 other company just woke up and they were like, "Well, we can't sell right now. It's impossible to sell. We need a new product and we need a new digital product. And who can deliver it in a few weeks? Um, that would be us. So in the end, eh, it's good." <laughs> Yeah, so we work with dozens of insurers to be able to make sure that we have the most competitive uh, products available. Uh, and uh, prior to COVID, every time we'd go in, we'd uh, put forth our value proposition, making it easier for consumers to buy your products as a large insurer. And the insurers would listen to us. They would be very excited about it. But when it got time to actually uh, you know, put the pedal to the metal and make things happen, there was so much uh, momentum and uh, movement in going in the other direction that it was really hard for big companies to uh, make things happen at a time scale that works for a small business or a startup. What we realized immediately is that it, it wasn't because there wasn't a strong desire to do that. It was because they, there were just so many concerns and worries and there wasn't enough of a value behind it. When COVID hit, that equation flipped upside down. Suddenly, uh, companies that had been you know, working on these uh, POCs and, and projects for ages, but were always uh, relegated to sort of the small, you know, looks good, but doesn't really account for much of our business, were forced to move those programs into the spotlight. And, uh, and that was a real surprise to me. It's just how uh, companies who we considered to be um, slow and uh, less agile we're able to turn on a dime and say, no, we're, we're ready to do this and, and we need your help. We're gonna do it now though. And that, that was a big surprise to me. I expected it to take longer. So I guess like, I agree with Ambrose. Uh, what doesn't kill us make us stronger. If that kills the competitor, that's even better. So stay alive. <laughs> <laughs> we have a few minutes left. Um, um, I think one of the questions I can ask you, um, it's do you have, Constructive feedbacks for corporate to work with you guys. Sorry, consult what? Constructive feedbacks. Um, how they can change the way that they're working, uh, how they can be more proactive, efficient to work with a company like yours. Um, sure, yeah. Um, I mean, adopting agile methodologies is definitely one of them. Um, I mean, even some, some companies that have been like founded quite a long time ago and had this quite old mentality, for example, uh, some life insurers, uh, completely adopted agile methodologies, had a scrum master, had some product owners, and started uh, building the products with us, uh, completely, uh, well, in a, using the agile methodologies, so scrum, two weeks, like basically quite standard. So they, they didn't, they just started it. 
So they, did, they didn't adapt. Of course, agile methodologies, you need to adapt it to your business. Some people would use, for example, the story points. Some of them will not because it doesn't make sense for them. It works for other kind of businesses. Some people do one week sprints or two week sprints. So, so they still need to adapt to their business so that the, the people that they're working with or the products that they want to build is uh, would, would be perfect. That the methodology really uh, suits the, the product they're trying to build. So we need more companies like this. Uh, companies that uh, always worked in, um, well, basically that was, t that was stuck in the, in the 90s uh, regarding methodology. And uh, since COVID uh, started to wake up and work with new standards that are actually working so much better and has been proven to work much better for already two decades. So yeah, so more companies like this, more people uh, using this methodology. You have one minute each before we, we finalize this uh, panel discussion. Sure, make business decisions based on results. So uh, start with small projects, uh, but projects that are quantifiable, uh, and then see how it turns out. We've uh, seen that we can produce results. Uh, and then uh, just sort of as a last one minute, I'd just like to say thank you all for listening. Uh, as startups, we do face a lot of risks in this COVID environment, uh, but I do think it's actually by uh, facing those risks head on, uh, we end up using that as a competitive advantage, not as a cost. Your turn. Learn from DBS, like do POC, <laughs> pay POC is even better. Um, and, and again, like agile, and then I guess um, um, making like the bank infrastructure also like um, getting adopted to like the latest standard, like cloud, uh, making uh, connection easier, making like trial and experiment easier. After all stuff is based on like trial and error. Just like this um, uh, virtual conference, right? We, we experienced some, some, some technical errors, but it's a way to learn so that we can make a better conference next time, right? Wonderful, so uh, agile, cloud, quick wins. Well, thank you very much for your, all your insights. It was a pleasure to be with you on stage. Thank you, WHUB, to organizing this uh, Startup Impact Summit today. And you were with uh, uh, three wonderful speakers. So thanks, everyone, and have a, a good day ahead. Cheers. Yeah, thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Bye. Bye.